Hey everyone, it's Nightharrow here, and today I have my Stamina Nightblade build guide for you. Special thanks to Nola for all of her help with this build. We'll start off, everything will be timestamped down below. We'll start off here with skills, and then we'll move on to the rest of the build. I've also gotten some feedback from you guys recently that you'd really like to see some gameplay with all these various builds. I, I have plans to do that. I'm just working on a website in the background, and we also have this huge update coming, so I haven't had a chance to, you know, sit down and, and play and, and stream for an hour, or record for an hour, or whatever, and work in gameplay on some of these videos, just because I'm trying to go so quickly with them so hope you'll hope you'll bear with me and for the time being if you are concerned about how well these builds will actually function uh, when they're in content and not on a build i can i can promise you they're solid a lot of testing goes into these builds before i actually put them out all right with that let's go ahead and get into it and talk about these skills so first up here is going to be twisting path twisting path is a is a nice area of effect damage it also does a couple of other things for us. One is it will proc major resolve. Now the, the base uh, duration of that is only six seconds and then increases per piece of heavy armor, which generally speaking, we're gonna have none. Uh, but just realize casting the skill does give you major resolve, reducing your damage taken. Uh, by 9% for six seconds. And any skill actually in, in the uh, the shadow skill line will do that. That's just from a passive in the skill line. This does good damage and it also provides us and anybody who walks through the path with major expedition, increasing our speed by 30%. That might not seem like that big of a deal, but it's actually pretty nice to have in a lot of situations, always being able to provide major expedition for your group. After that, we have Killer's Blade. Killer's Blade is our execute ability. So whenever we're, we're parsing on a target and we get under 30%, we're gonna swap instead of using our normal spamble, we're gonna instead use killer, Killer's Blade. And the reason for that is it just does the most damage. After that, we have our main spamble. We're gonna use Surprise Attack, which is really nice because it's actually a class ability. You don't always get to use a class ability uh, as your main spamble on, on any given build. You could also swap this out though for your favorite spammable. There is nothing you know amazing about Surprise Attack that makes it so much better than any other uh, spamble ability. If you're using a Bobo build, this is actually where you would swap out and put in your Lethal Arrow as well if you want to make this a fully ranged build. After that, we have a choose your own adventure here. So there's two main ways of kind of parsing on a Nightblade right now. And I say that there's there's more nuance to it, uh, as you might imagine. But there's two main ways. One is to, you know, you, you put on Relentless Focus and you can just leave it there as the passive and never actually cast the skill. So in that case, it's giving you passive weapon and spell damage. That makes your rotation a lot easier for you. And that's why you might want to do it. Do you lose a little bit of damage around 3 chaos? Yes, that's what Nola found for us by not using this proc. That was the difference in her parses. Uh, but honestly, it simplifies the rotation quite a bit. And so if you're someone who's not par parsing, you know, over 100K or maybe even, you know, over 90 or 80K, then not having to cast this so often could actually be the move for you to go and might help your DPS. And then as you get better, when you get your DPS a little bit higher, maybe you want to swap in and start learning how to parse act actively using that skill. The other thing is you might want to leave it procced and, and only use it in certain situations when you're about to take a bunch of damage. So if you have Merciless Resolve here, uh, whenever you're in melee and you cast this skill, it's going to heal you for a significant amount. Or I'm sorry, actually both both morphs do that. What am I saying? Uh, the magic morph just heals you for a bit more. So in that situation, if you're overland or maybe if you're in a trial and you're about to take a bunch of damage and you know that, Starfall on the warrior, uh, any number of places, what you can do is wait till you take that that you know, big chunk of damage and then use this skill as a burst heal. And I will say that the burst heal portion of this skill is why I recommend leaving it on your front bar. Even, even though you could, in theory, if you're just leaving it proc, you could put it on your back bar to have that burst heal ready whenever you need it. You probably want that on your front bar. And so that's why we have it here. And then when we go to, you know, eventually learning to use it more actively, you can, you can do so quite easily. It's already in the same place on your bar that it has been. And you just need to learn to work it into your rotation. After that, we have Barb Trap. Barb Trap is still a nice damage over time. It's not quite as awesome as it used to be, uh, but it's still a good one and it provides us with minor force, which increases our critical damage done by 10%. So that's why we have it here. It's a fighter skilled skill ability. So just being on our bar also gives us increased weapon and spell damage. And then for our ultimate, incapacitating strikes. So recent changes to this skill have made it last, instead of six seconds, it now lasts eight seconds. And instead of giving us recoveries, it no longer does. All that has been moved to siphoning strike. So what does that mean? <laughs> well, it means sustain on a night blade is now not nearly as nice as it used to be, as you would almost always run incapacitating strikes. Certainly if you ever needed it, you would make sure you're running it. So all that has been moved onto another skill. It does last for longer whenever you use it, but generally speaking, the use of this skill, it remains mostly the same. The idea here is that it's a very low cost ultimate 
and you're just going to use it whenever you can off of cooldown. Typically, you want to make sure all of your dots are refreshed first, then you cast this skill, and then for the next eight seconds, hopefully, uh, you want to just be using your spammables during that time for maximum damage. You might have to let a few dots fall off. You'll just recast them once that duration is over, but while it's actually cast, the best thing to do is just continually cast your spammable for maximum DPS. And if there's a situation where you're not able to cast this right off of cooldown or you just finish some trash, uh, if you go in with a little bit more ultimate, you can get a longer duration out of this buff. So bigger burst windows whenever you first go into a boss pool, for example. And in that case, you just want to put on all your dots uh, and then cast this and then spamble for the next eight seconds, if you can. <laughs> now moving on to our back bar. First skill up here is going to be Stampede. We're using that for a couple of reasons, but main one is that we're using it with the Maelstrom's Greatsword on our back bar. We're also using it because there's one skill from every weapon skill line that will make sure your back bar enchantment stays procced even when you're, when you're on your front bar. Not all skills do this. It's a hidden mechanic. The, the game doesn't tell you that, but uh, in this case, Stampede is, is what we're gonna be using, and that's the skill from the skill line that does that. If you decide to go with a Bobo build, then you're gonna do Endless Hail here instead. Swap it out one-to-one, -one, not really a big deal. This skill is also our gap closer, so whenever we're moving into combat, we wanna apply what we can at range, and then we'll use this as our gap closer to get in there and, uh, and get our damage on. Our next skill here is Siphoning Strikes. Siphoning Strikes is, is where all of that recovery has gone. It's gone from our ultimate onto Siphoning Strikes. So uh, this is a skill that, you know, you can look again at some of those really high parses you'll find out there and you'll see that people aren't running this. Uh, that means that they are, are being very economical about their synergies. It means that their, their build is 100% locked in. There's no changes from, from what they're doing. Uh, and it still, it can be very difficult to keep up. Certainly for the average person, it can be. So just slotting siphoning strikes is a way of kind of solving that problem for us. Generally speaking, we won't cast this skill unless we're overland or perhaps in a solo or in a dungeon because we won't need to. Now, if you are running low on resources and you have Ring of the Pale Order on and you're running solo or you're running in an arena or something like that, you can actively cast it to get more resources back. Or if you're in a dungeon and you got a healer making sure that, you know, they're keeping you alive, uh, really any situation, you can, in theory, trade some health for some more resources. You just want to be careful that you don't kill yourself accidentally doing that or drop yourself to a lower health and then get killed because of it. Uh, but in general, we just leave this on our bar and whenever we light attack, which we will always want to be doing, we'll be uh, recovering extra resources. Next skill up here is going to be another weapon skill. So we're going to go with Carve. Carve is a really nice, long lasting damage over time ability. So in any kind of long fight, Carve is really nice. Each additional time you cast it, the duration goes up by 10 seconds. It goes from 12 to 22 to 32. And you want to, because of that, you want to make sure that you don't let it drop off because if so, you'll have to start back at the 12 second duration. So cast this a couple seconds early if you need to, to make sure the duration doesn't fall off. Other than that, it's just a really nice damage over time ability. If you're in short fights, this could be a skill that you might want to swap out for something else if you're in, in big burst fights, because it, it does take a little bit of time to get that maximum utility out of it with the longer duration. If we're using a Bobo build, we're going to go with Poison Injection here. If you want to use any other back bar, you can just swap in the appropriate weapon skill here or one of those from our useful skills list over on the side if you wanted to go with like a, 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 a Inferno Staff back bar or something like that. And then our fourth skill here is going to be Debilitate. Debilitate, uh, I'm really happy with the changes recently and what that this has happened with Debilitate. Debilitate it has a, a higher chance of, of proccing the overcharge status effect. And now that the changes to the status effects, that means this does a significant amount of damage. So what that means is that this dot used to be a good dot. You needed you needed some, some spots to fill in here on a Nightblade. It's actually quite quite good now. It's, it's, it's a really great dot for a Nightblade. This is a single target dot. So if you're doing something like in Cloud Rest, you're doing the various crystals, you can actually place it on each one of them and it won't overwrite the previous instances. So if you're ever trying to dot up multiple targets, you can actually cast this on multiple targets and it'll stay ticking on each one of them. If you're on a full AOE fight where, you know, everything is AOE, you probably don't want to do that. It's probably not quite worth the cast. And in that situation, you do something kind of weird here. What you actually do is swap path from your front bar uh, to this spot and, and take debilitate off your bar. And then on your front bar, you want to put in Lotus Fan. 
Okay, the reason for that is because Lotus Fan is another AoE ability. It does teleport you to a target. It's also quite fun, uh, but that's why it's over there on the useful skills. And, and again, in pure AoE fights, that's why you take this off. But generally speaking, it's a really good dot and you'll generally just leave it on your bar. And then after that, we have our Dark Shade. Shade is just a really nice damage over time ability. It also applies Minor Maim to our targets, reducing their damage done by 5%. Now, in a lot of situations, you can get that from other places if you're in a group setting. It's really nice to have solo and it can actually be nice for your tanks even in group content. Uh, and it does good DPS. So all around, great skill, no reason to really take it off your bar if you can help it. And then on our back bar, typically we would, if we're parsing, we'll run incapacitating strikes on both bars. Being from the assassination skill line, it gives increased critical just by being there. So that's why we often will see it on both bars on the Nightblade. And it used to also be for the recoveries, no longer. Uh, if you instead need an AOE ultimate, you have a couple of choices here. What I have suggested is Soul Tether. Soul Tether is from our Nightblade skill line. So that's nice. It's always fun to have fla properly flavored skills on our bar and not just be using classic Gnostic skills. This is a nice AoE ability and does damage comparable to like a Destro ultimate whenever you calculate the like per ultimate cost. Now Destro ults cost more so at any given burst a Destro ult would do more damage in theory uh, but as far as ultimate cost to damage done which is often the metric you want to use for ultimates uh, it's very comparable but this is what you'd use in an AoE and in most actual content situations you usually leave this on your back bar. It also heals you for a, a large portion of the damage done and so it can be a great way to kind of oh shit button uh, to really keep yourself alive especially if there are multiple targets you can hit at the same time aoe grinding lots of situations it's useful if you want something a little bit more optimal but could be a lot harder to get the mages guild ultimate shooting star actually works really well. All right, now let's go ahead and move on and talk about some of these useful skills. So if you're in an AOE fight, we already kind of talked about what you can do with uh, swapping out Debilitate, uh, moving Lotus Fan to your front bar. Another thing you can do is, is, is instead of using our single target Spamble Surprise Attack, you can instead slop in the two-handed weapon Whirling Blades. And the reason for that is because it, it, it's a very cheap uh, AOE attack and uh, and you can use it as your main spamble even when you're single target and then if it's mostly an AOE fight it'll be really like your your damage will go way up uh, just think about it if it does comparable damage maybe a little bit less than a single target ability but now you're hitting two two targets you've increased the damage by 100%, okay? So no other single target spamble is gonna be doing twice the damage of this skill. So if you're typically gonna be hitting at least one target, you actually just swap this in on your bar and use that instead. Uh, beneath that, we have Deadly Cloak. There's actually two morphs of the skill. Both morphs are, are equally good, or, or both both morphs are very good, okay? Uh, so Quick Cloak is the other one. It gives you evasion, which will reduce your damage taken in AoE, which can have some utility to it. This is a stamina costing skill. It's from the dual weapon skill line. Uh, this, if we could sustain, if you're on a class that, or a race rather, that has some more stamina sustain, it might be the case that you actually want to swap this into your front bar and maybe you don't need siphoning strikes or maybe you're particularly, you know, good at, at managing your resources and you don't, uh, you would just back bar our, our, uh, twisting path and then swap this into your front bar in that in that location and if you look at some of the meta builds i think you'll find that mo most of them tend to be more in in that uh in that vein but again if you're ever running out of resources in content it's almost always better to swap out a skill so that you don't run out of resources because that's going to tank your damage way more than you know some skill that does a little bit more damage or, or something like that so just keep that in mind <laughs> uh, usually with with the kind of the rule of thumb with swapping out a skill on your bar is that if assuming you have all dps abilities and you swap out one for a non-dps a utility skill a passive skill something else you usually lose like 1k damage that's what i typically find i mean it depends on your build depends on the setup whatever, but it's usually minimal loss of damage. If you swap out two skills, you usually end up more in that like 3K damage range. And if you swap out more, it gets worse. <laughs> and I mean, you know, at some point it'll level out, but uh, as long as you're casting a spammable every every attack, uh, but just keep that in mind. Swapping out one skill isn't that big of a deal. Swapping out two becomes a little bit more of a deal. Swapping out three, you're really losing a significant amount of DPS. So just keep that in mind. Oh, and the other reason you might want to use uh, Deadly Cloak will, will uh, be a little bit more pure damage if you're just going for damage but quick cloak also lasts 30 seconds over 20 seconds so in addition to the evasion it provides you it also doesn't have to be cast quite as often and that can be nice in content 
After that, we have Sap Essence or Power Extraction. Both morphs of this skill are good. Uh, this is an AoE spammable that we can use on a Nightblade. It is very expensive, which is why typically we'll be using Whirling Blades instead. Uh, but just realize, actually, one of the things I recommend on my Trash setup for my Nightblade, which I, I have build guides for specifically for Trash or Overland, it, you'll just be able to nuke stuff Overland if you follow that build guide. You actually use a Stamina and a Magicka spammable. And whenever you run out of Stamina using your Stamina, spamble you swap and use your magic spamble and it allows you to basically just murder everything <laughs> uh, and be able to continue cast skills and not worry about running out of resources even while overland it works quite well and sap essence will actually heal you for a percentage of the damage cost and if you're aoe grinding that's pretty huge it's pretty nice hopefully you already if you're aoe grinding you're already using ring of the pale order but it, it's just extra heals, I suppose. Probably overkill. <laughs> After that, we have Lotus Fan. Lotus Fan, we've kind of already talked about. Lotus Fan is from the Assassination skill line. So again, having it on our bar will increase our critical strike chance. So typically, if we're swapping it onto our bar, we want to try to put it on the front bar because that'll give us maximum damage. This teleports you to a target. It does initial upfront damage and then also does AoE damage. And I'm sorry, it does initial damage in an AoE and then it does damage over time also in that AoE. Uh, really nice skill. I think it's undervalued. It's a little bit weird because it is ch channeled, so you can't block cast while using it. Uh, it is also very expensive at like 4,000 Magicka just underneath. So keep that in mind, but it's a really nice skill if you can sustain it. Uh, could be something where you want to swap in, AoE fights, what have you. And it's just a really fun skill to have. Uh, after that, we have Resolving Vigor. If we need some sort of heal over time, I recommend Resolving Vigor. We could use several other things. Swallow Soul, which is another uh, Magicka costing Nightblade skill, can also be decent for a little bit of heal over time. Most of the time, if you're you know running around solo or whatever, you can put on Ring of the Pale Order. Uh, but Resolving Vigor, if you're in group content, you're doing Portals and Cloud Rest, can be a really nice skill to put on your bar. In that case, it you know it it's kind of depends on the fight a bit. I would probably tend to slop, swap out cleave uh, again it depends on the fight depends on what's going on if the fight is very long cleave has more utility if the fights are shorter it has burst phases then it has a little bit less utility so for example if you're in a uh, veteran rock grove and you're on the second boss beside and you're having to switch between the main target and then the atros the main target and then the atros uh, something like carve is not going to be the best skill for you so that could be something you remove from your bar and then you could either swap a skill on your front bar to have vigor on your front bar or if you're fine with it leave it on your back bar for the heal there both are fine all right, now let's go ahead and move on and talk about our gear. So first up here is going to be Aegis Caller. Aegis Caller has replaced Pillar of Nern for melee builds. You need to do melee martial damage to proc Aegis Caller, whereas Pillar of Nern can proc off of anything. But Aegis Caller, with the recent changes to the status effects, actually does more damage. And the reason for that is because it does damage. It, it, it's procced most of the time. So some, some skills, it's like, okay, there's a 12-second window, and it procs for four of those seconds, and then there's a cooldown. But it does a bunch Bunch of damage for that four seconds. Uh, Aegis Caller is not like that. Aegis Caller does most of its damage over the entirety of its proc time with very little cooldown. And because of that, and because of the way bleed damage works right now, which is the kind of damage it does, it ends up being one of the best uh, one of the best sets that we can use uh, on any build, as long as we're doing that melee martial damage that we need to actually proc it. All right. <laughs> I know that's a mouthful. I just want to kind of explain why the set's good. Uh, after that, we pair it with Whirl of the Depths. With this build, we're typically going to be trying to run, and with all builds right now, uh, five medium at least and then we want at least one piece of light maybe two pieces of light that will help you with your sustain it kind of depends what race you are what's optimal but you want to make sure you're at penetration cap that's where, where light armor kind of comes in and why it's so important and then after that you just want as much medium armor for maximum damage in general Okay, there's more to it, but that's the general rule. We're pairing this with the Velothi Urmage Amulet. This increases all of our damage by 15%, but reduces the damage of our light attacks to basically nothing. Uh, what this is nice for is that it helps all of our damage. That means AOE damage and everything else, whereas light attacks are purely single target and only on, you know, only on the th whatever we're light attacking, okay? So that's why we like Velothi Urmage Amulet. It also works in all situations. <laughs> there's never a situation where you don't where you don't want to use it. It works well every 
everywhere. There are certain sets and certain setups where maybe you would want to go with a monster set for maximum single target damage, but this is a great all around build that will work in all situations. We're pairing that, as we mentioned, with a Maelstrom Greatsword on our back bar. So we're front barring World Adepts. We're bodying, generally speaking, Aegis. You can't put it on your jewelry. It doesn't matter. Just go with that five medium if we can. And then we're pairing that with one piece of Slime Crawl. Some optional sets for you here. If you want to go for maximum damage, World Adepts is a very easy to use set, and that's why I really like recommending it. But you could go with something like Cruel Riptide. If you do that, you are going to have to play the stamina mini game, where you want to keep your stamina below at least 50%, and it'll get, do even more damage down to like 35. Uh, but at least 50%, if you can keep your stamina underneath that, then Cruel Riptide is the way to go. And what I would recommend, it just can be a little bit, a bit of a pain and require some micromanagement. Another option to swap out instead of Aegis Caller, you could also use Advancing Yokita. Uh, there are reasons for this. Aegis Caller will tend to proc in one location. It's a big AOE, and that's really nice in some situations. But if a boss is really mobile, something like Advancing Yokita will actually be better for it. And that's kind of the, the general theme in ESO. There's sets that are almost as good, but they're not good in every situation. Or sets that are a little bit worse, but they are good in every situation. That's kind of the trade-off you get. And usually, for most people, that trade-off is is negligible. It's very small. Uh, it's only when you get to the highest level that you really care about those minor differences in DPS. And uh, that's a lot of the people I hang out with. So, so that's why I always like to cover it here, but also give advice that's more generally applicable. Uh, after that, Reliquin, Arms of Reliquin, that's another trial set. You always want to run one trial set, one non-trial set. That's almost always the best setup for you as far as maximum damage. And, uh, and so Arms of Reliquin, you could swap in for World Adepts. The reason that we would do that is because it does the most single target damage but you need to make sure it's similarly similar with advancing Yokita that you have to continually be light attacking to keep that proc on a target. If there's any, uh, any, you know, opportunity where you can't light attack the target for more than five seconds, then you're going to drop stacks and that means you're going to lose a lot of damage. So keep that in mind. And then for our crafted set, if you're just getting started, I'd recommend orders wrath. Craft that mostly in medium. Again, run five medium, a couple of pieces of light if you can. Order's Wrath is a great all-around set. The only problem with Order's Wrath and why I wouldn't just say, hey, just use this set is when you get to optimal content, it, the five-piece bonus will basically be doing nothing for you because there is a crit damage cap. And if you're in optimized content, you, you're not really expected to have that much of your own source of that extra damage. You get more of it from your group buffs and from the rest of the party. So in that situation, you would run to run something else. But Order's Wrath will last you for a very long time. And if you're running with unoptimized groups, it's still going to be be very useful and, and, and not gonna you're not gonna be losing anything at all. Uh, pair that with Aegis Caller or whatever set you have. A lot of times people are like, hey, I just started, uh, you know, get a set of Order's Wrath. You could do Law of Julianos as another crafted set. Uh, that's There's probably something better, but honestly, it doesn't matter because you're gonna outgrow those sets and you can go get Aegis Caller as soon as you hit max level. You know, as soon as you hit max CP 160, as far as gear, you can just go farm Aegis Caller on normal. It'll be pretty easy for you. It'll be a little bit tricky tricky getting around or whatever, but anybody can do it is my point, I suppose. Uh, after that, let's talk about weapon traits. Uh, so on our front bar, we're running double charged daggers, just does the most damage. That's why we're doing it. For our back bar, we're going infused with a, a uh, berserker enchant, increasing our weapon and spell damage. For our jewelry, we'll go bloodthirsty and then weapon damage enchants. And then for our body, we're going all divines and all stamina enchants because we're stacking stamina with this build. For our blue CP, we have Wrathful Strikes, Deadly Aim, Mastered Arms, and Exploiter. Those just do the most damage. That's why we're using them. <laughs> if you are overland and you don't have a source of off balance because everything is constantly facing you, so your surprise attack can't set them off balance, then you could swap Exploiter out for something else. And in that case, I would recommend Thaumatology. Uh, moving on to our red CP, it's a choose your own adventure. Whatever looks good, that's what you should go with here. I personally really like Fortified, Celerity, Expert Evasion, and Rejuvenation. I recommend those on almost all my builds. There is Slippery, which is a really nice one to slot from time to time. I'm sorry, Fortified will increase your armor. Celerity gives you a little bit of extra speed. Expert Evasion gives you a free roll dodge about every 30 seconds. Rejuvenation increases our recovery, which we are going to need on this build with the recent changes to the Nightblade. Uh, but again, Slippery can be amazing. It lets you break free without 
without costing anything and does it automatically. That can be really important in certain fights, useless in others. Uh, and there are other CP. So, you know, whatever you want to do on the red tree, there's no real wrong answer here. For our attributes, we're going to put all 64 points into stamina because this is a stamina build. And having more max resources actually gives you more uh, equivalent of weapon and spell damage. So it actually increases your damage. That's why you want to stack. It picks the highest of your stamina or magicka with a hybrid meta now. So that's why we want to stack absolutely as much as we can of one of those resources. For Mundus, we'll go with the Thief Mundus. Just increase our critical strike chance, causes us to do the most damage. That's why we picked that. For race, most optimal is going to be Dark Elf. Dark Elf will do the most damage. Uh, Orc slightly behind that, and Wood Elf slightly behind that. Khajiit, if you're going overland solo, Khajiit is always pretty much always the best best way to go uh, for overland and for solo content, non like large group content, because of their extra critical damage whenever you're not at cap can be quite advantageous. And then potions, we're going with weapon power potions uh, for food. So if you, if you're parsing and you want pure max damage, then you want green food that gives you only stamina because it'll give you 6,000 stamina versus like 5,000 if you have buy stat food. Uh, and so that's best to parse on and it's best to use in content if you can survive without extra health. To play it safe, going with something like buy stat food can be really nice, max health, max stamina, and you only lose a little bit of damage. If you are uh, having problems with sustain and if you're in, you know, four man content, solo content, you might still have problems with sustain on this build because again, uh, the changes to the Nightblade recently, then you might want to go with like a tri-stat food, something that dubious camera and throne that will give you max health, max stamina and stamina recovery can be a really good middle ground. Every time you add another attribute to your food, you're kind of losing a little bit of damage. In general, it's not that much, okay? So <laughs> do what you need if, for the situation, stack as much stamina as you can, add health, add recovery as you need to. If you're parsing or if you're in a situation where you just want max damage and you need recovery, then you'll go with something like Lava Foot Stomp Soup. But anyways, I think that's it for today. Again, a special thanks to Nola, to Moore, to Sky, and all the people that help with these builds, Gag, everybody else who helps with these builds. I really appreciate it, guys. Daedric, uh, I, 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 I'm scared to say names sometimes because I know I'm gonna forget somebody, but all the people in the Discord who help out with these builds all the time, I really appreciate it. All right, guys, we'll catch you the next one. Thanks for watching.